United States has always demonstrated a propensity for developing some of the best aerial technology globally. Hence, it wasn't that much of a surprise that they already conjured up a direct replacement for the retired Lockheed Martin SR-71 Blackbird, a manned aerial vehicle popular for its intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capability. How much does this new hypersonic jet pale in comparison to the SR-71? Does the new jet offer more advantages than the manned SR-71? Join us as we discuss the unveiling of the SR-72 Son of Blackbird. One of the United States military's greatest achievements of the past century is arguably its power in the air. The senior 71 Blackbird, a Cold War marvel that traversed behind enemy lines, is highly rated for its intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. The senior 71 points out that technology developed out of great necessity. It is rarely news that war is half won when you have solid intelligence about the enemy. Hence, it was rather important to find a way to gather intelligence undetected. During the Cold War, which began in 1947 between the capitalist United States and the communist USSR, it became imperative for both parties to win the war. Hence, different security and reconnaissance measures were taken in that regard. To that effect, the United States Air Force enlisted the help of Lockheed Martin, Skunk Division, to build a reconnaissance jet berthing the U-2, a high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, in 1957. The U-2, which was built in complete secrecy by a Lockheed Martin team led by Kelly Johnson, was by far the best intelligence-gathering jet that anyone could find around at the time. Its efficiency was so incredible that the Central Intelligence Agency agreed to deploy it for surveillance during the Cold War. It was an important spying tool that was used to gather intelligence on the Soviet Union, Cuba, Vietnam, and even China. It is widely reported that the U-2 provided them with key intelligence during the war. Its ability to fly under the radar at a high altitude made it nearly undetectable. It provided the United States valuable intelligence on the Soviet Union's military might in the late 1950s, with the Soviets none the wiser about their ways. While the U-2 was known for its ability to fly at high altitudes and narrowly avoid detection, in war, narrowly is never enough. Hence, on May 1, 1960, the United States sent a Central Intelligence Agency civilian pilot, Francis Gary Power, on a reconnaissance mission on the Soviet Union in a bid to gather intelligence. However, Francis's U-2 was shot out of the sky with the Soviet surface-to-air missile, the A-75 Davina. Although none of the missiles directly hit the U-2, one of the missiles at the extreme of its radar tracking ability exploded right behind the U-2 and was enough to take it down. Gary Francis was captured after surviving the crash and was convicted of espionage, an act of secretly spying on an opposition and gathering intelligence without their knowledge. Soon, he was exchanged for Abel Rudolph, a Russian spy who was captured by the Americans. The American president at the time, Dwight Eisenhower, wasn't completely pleased by the result, and he also believed that the U-2 should remain in deployment, and so it was. However, he had always noted the need for a jet that could fly at higher altitudes and with serious stealth capabilities so that it could spy on any one country with a lesser risk of detection than the U-2. Hence, the United States once again reached out to Lockheed Martin and their skunk division, which has the reputation of building an impossible jet in an incredibly short space of time. The war was a priority to the United States and they needed to win hence the desperation for safer ways to gather intelligence. In Burbank, Lockheed's Advanced Development Group got to work on a revolutionary aircraft just before the news of Gary Powers' U-2 getting shot out of the sky. However, since they hadn't finished building before the news, they knew that the new aircraft had to not only fly faster than any aircraft ever made, but also fly at greater altitudes with a minimal radar cross-section. Washington was on their backs now about delivering a super jet and delivering it pronto. Kelly Johnson and his group of engineers under Skunk always had a reputation for meeting strategically critical deadlines, meaning this wasn't their first rodeo. However, even he was taken aback by the requirement of building the SR-71. Johnson explained that the aircraft was completely different from all other kinds of aircraft available at the time, as it was in a completely different category from all types of reconnaissance jets that had been built before it. He claimed that everything used in building the jet had to be invented from scratch, making it Skunk Work Division's toughest assignment to date, as they had to be innovative and challenging, 
all while aiming to deliver without pushing back the deadline as the country was counting on them. The speed of the SR-71 was built to exceed 2,000 miles per hour, making it almost five times faster than the U-2 Dragon Lady, which had a top speed of 500 miles per hour. While some other aircraft at the time could match that speed at the time, it was only in short bursts when they turned on the afterburners. However, the Senior 71 could maintain that speed for hours, making it nearly uncatchable for any aircraft at the time. While they built the jet, Lockheed Martin's Ben Rich spent hours trying to tackle the problem of how heat could be dissipated across the jet's entire airframe. Eventually, he came up with a basic solution, covering the jet in black paint because they can both emit and absorb heat. Not only did his faculty provide a solution to their problems, but it gave the jet the moniker Blackbird. While the jet remained in production, the United States government asked for an even further reduction of the radar image for stealth purposes. The logic was pretty simple. The smaller the radar image, the more impossible it is to be detected behind enemy lines. However, while the concept was easy enough to understand, it was a different monster to build. However, Lockheed Martin's skunk division was willing to go the distance in service to their country. Hence, they redesigned the surface of the Blackbird to avoid reflecting radar signals while also moving the engine to a mid-wing position. Although speed was important to the development, Washington wanted stealth as they mainly needed the SR-71 for gathering intelligence without detection. Hence, the radar-absorbing element added to the black painting, coupled with its ability to fly at a much higher altitude than the U-2 Dragon Lady came in handy. Before the Blackbird was released for operation, the Skunk Division hoisted it on a pylon in a secret location in the Nevada desert. They tested the Blackbird carefully to avoid the Soviet Union satellite observation. The results of the test paid serious dividends. It was designed as 100 feet long, yet it would only appear on radar as no bigger than a bird and even smaller than a man. It was the marvel of the Cold War, and until the war ended, no one could crack it. The jet was 90% ready, and America was on the verge of a breakthrough. While they continued building, their timetable was moved up with a direct order from Washington which was triggered by an incident in Cuba that almost cost the life of Air Force Major Rudolf Anderson while he was piloting a U-2 reconnaissance mission over Cuba and suffered a fatal injury from a Soviet surface-to-air strike. The Skunk Work Division responded swiftly by trying to attain a sustained speed for the Blackbird, and it became a reality on July 20th, 1963, when the Blackbird sustained a speed above Mach 3 at an astounding 78,000 feet. It was the fastest jet of its kind at the moment. Hence, no one had the experience of flying anything that moved that fast. It zipped across the skies at a never before seen speed of 3000 feet per second. Consequently, the rules of flight had to be rewritten. The conventional flights had rules of engagement for flying across rivers, highways, and metropolitan areas. However, all of those were considered obsolete and redundant, meaning that new rules had to be generated for this high flyer as pilots would be required to fly through mountain ranges, coastlines, and even bigger bodies of water. At the speed and altitude that the SR-71 was going, piloting it for the first time was definitely going to be a religious experience, and one of its very first pilots, Air Force Colonel Jim Watkins, was taken by surprise too. Nothing had prepared me to fly that fast. My God, even now I get goosebumps remembering, he said. The Seacher 71 was the greatest aerial breakthrough of the Cold War era, and at the time, the speed at which it went, coupled with the altitude, made it nearly impossible to not only be detected, but also shot out of the sky by surface-to-air missiles. Every attempt was believed to have missed the Blackbird wildly as they exploded many miles before it reached the intended target. After the diplomatic disturbance of Gary Powers' reconnaissance mission failure, the United States never flew the Blackbird over the Soviet Union. However, it was still impactful in winning the Cold War as it performed missions in other critical war zones like Vietnam, the Middle East, and North Korea. In 1976, the Blackbird set the record and still holds it for flying at a sustained altitude of just over 85,000 feet at a top speed of 2,193.2 miles per hour. While this records a serious breakthrough for aerial surveillance, America halted the program in 1990 owing to the development of unmanned aerial vehicles, like the MQ-1 Predator and the RQ-4 Global Hawk, both of which offered instant access to surveillance data unlike the Blackbird, which could only take photographs on tape, 
which is then sent back to base for analysis. The Blackbird was last flown by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Department in 1999 as they needed it for high-altitude aeronautical research. Since then, every surviving Blackbird has now been in museums spread across the United States, including the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, the Museum of Flight in Seattle, and the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Museum in Ohio. While the SR-71 Blackbird retains its status as the legendary icon of the Cold War, etching its wings into the valiant history of the United States, advancements in technology, and the evolution of military demands regarding intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance have paved the way for a new beast of the sky, the SR-72, otherwise called Son of the Blackbird. While the moniker already suggests its descendancy from the Great Blackbird, the SR-72 is about to make light work of the SR-71's capability. The Son of the Blackbird is another Lockheed Martin Skunk Division's marvel. It is a hypersonic unmanned aerial vehicle. Hence, if you thought the Blackbird was fast, this is faster than the speed of sound at an incredible Mach 5. The impact of the Blackbird on the Cold War is rumored to have created a bit of nostalgia, and Washington wanted more where that came from. Therefore, in 2013, Lockheed Martin proposed it as a successor to the United States government in secrecy. The intentions remain mostly the same, meaning that it would be used for gathering intelligence, surveillance, and of course, reconnaissance, just like the Blackbird. In the 60s, the reconnaissance jets focused on the use of stealth to invade enemy territory. However, evolution in technology and advancement in warfare seem to have made the fifth generation stealth useless especially with the development of the anti-access and area denial tactics. Consequently, there was a paradigm shift from the use of stealth to speed, hence the importance of the hypersonic architecture built into the son of the Blackbird. Although the official proposition happened in 2013, there are unfounded reports of a sighting of the SR-72 in 2007. The SR-72 is primed to reshape the balance against super military adversaries like China, Russia, and Iran, while tilting the air struggle back in favor of the United States. For a while now, the existence of the jet has been clouded in doubt and shrouded in mysticism. But on November 1st, 2013, an article on Lockheed Martin Skunk Works was published by a flagship magazine, Aviation Week in Space Technology. As you can well imagine, a piece about the coming of a jet that supersedes the Blackbird in altitude and speed took over the Aviation Week servers causing their website to lag for a considerable period of time, Lockheed officials announced their plan to build an optionally piloted prototype that would be about 60 feet long, about the same size as the F-22 Raptor, and powered by an engine that enables it to fly at the super speed of Mach 6. The SR-72 will supposedly be able to sustain a Mach speed of over 5, meaning that it could result in high temperatures and melt conventional metallic airframes. In a bid to rectify this, engineers are researching other types of high-performance metal that could withstand the heat. It is almost similar to using titanium while building the Blackbird to help absorb the heat while it reaches the maximum speed of Mach 3 at the time. However, as much as Lockheed Martin believes that they could pull it off, there have been think pieces all over America where some serious concerns have been put out in the air. Questions hang right on top of Lockheed Martin. Is achieving hypersonic speed possible without casualties, or are they just trying to stroke their ego by trying to outdo the Blackbird? Although these claims seem to bother Americans, Lockheed Martin remains resolute. Their construction of the SR-71 has proven that they solve any problem required. Hence, the aerodynamics and thermal concerns over the resulting heat that could come from friction between the speed of the jet and the air are taken into consideration, and they are working on it. To prove their resilience even further, in June 2017, Lockheed Martin officially announced that the SR-72 was entering the development phase in the early 2020s, with Rob Weiss, their executive vice president, relaying it to the press. In a moment of candid optimism, he said, we've been saying hypersonics are two years away for the last 20 years, but all I can say is the technology is mature and we, along with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and the services, are working hard to get that capability into the hands of our warfighters as soon as possible. From that point on, many doubts about Lockheed's capability to generate a hypersonic jet died a natural death. By January 2018, 
Jack O'Banion revealed that innovations like additive manufacturing and advanced computer modeling, which had been a stumbling block for them, have now been strategically put in place. Also, he discussed the use of three-dimensional printers to create complex cooling systems to be integrated directly into the aircraft's engine. This development showcased a breakthrough in tackling the problem of intense heat generation by moving at hypersonic speed. For context, the SR-71 aircraft, operating at a maximum speed of Mach 3, generated a heat of over 600 degrees Fahrenheit, resulting in the necessary use of titanium and jet black paint for heat absorption and emission. Now imagine the type of metal needed for a Mach 6 speed, which will generate double or triple the heat of the SR-71. In 2018, Lockheed confirmed that the SR-72 prototype was on track for its first full flight in 2025 and would be armed with hypersonic missiles and likely enter service in the 2030s. While the United States seems to have found its way around the hypersonic aerodynamic and thermal problems, other nations, including China and Russia, remain in tune to accelerate their hypersonic jets. As expected, one of the superpowers gaining the superficial advantage of hypersonic jets could very much tilt a war before it is even fought. Since stealth has suddenly become rather inefficient in modern warfare, controlling super speed is like being the first to discover fire all over again, effectively keeping the wolves away. In modern warfare, there are not many sophisticated air defenses better than Russia's S-400 and S-500 defense missile systems. The S-500 Prometheus, also known as the 55 or 6M, is a surface-to-air missile used for anti-ballistic systems. The missile was developed by the Almaz Anti-Air Defense Concern. While Russia has claimed that the defense system could successfully target and take out all types of aerial threats, recent reports have claimed that it is quite powerless against the hypersonic speed of the SR-72. Similarly, China's Anti-Access and Area Denial, popularly referred to as A2AD, is a military strategy focusing on the use of long-range missiles operating at altitudes well beyond most fighter aircraft to serve as a key deterrent against enemy aircraft. At the whiff of an enemy aircraft in the clouds, the Chinese defense delivers a devastating hypersonic missile with unprecedented speed and precision, enabling rapid, high-impact strikes. This defense strategy has proven effective when in action and tested against numerous aircraft. However, the Chinese intelligence remains on their toes as they currently have no known effective countermeasure against the unprecedented speed of the Son of Blackbird. The upcoming launch of the SR-72 is a display of power and potential force, meaning that the United States, upon launching the aircraft, has played their hands, and now the world patiently waits for the response of the military superpowers across the world. Whether a country comes up with a sufficient plan to stop the United States' Sea on your 72, or America lays an undisputed claim to being the kings of the air remains to be seen. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.